Please be advised, this episode does have content that some may find distressing. As always, listener discretion is advised and it is not suitable for anyone under the age of 13. I just want to give an additional warning to this episode. I try, as best I can, to stay away from going into gory details regarding the causes of death. But in this case, I feel it is important to note these details. To give a better picture of how depraved this individual was and why his crimes were so shocking. That being said, I completely understand if you wish to skip this episode, if you feel such information will cause you distress. Hello and welcome to episode 38 of It's Murder Up North. I just want to say thank you for continuing to support the podcast. I appreciate the kind reviews, new followers and my Patreon members. As always, you can support the show by leaving reviews on iTunes, joining the It's Murder Up North Facebook group, following the podcast on Twitter, and signing up to patreon.com forward slash It's Murder Up North for exclusive content and early ad-free episodes. My podcast of the week comes from a wonderful friend and fellow northerner. Fern has been a constant support since I started the show. She is a source of confidence, advice and friendship, and I am blessed to have gotten to know her. After much nagging, she has finally made a promo for her show, Evidence of a Crime, and here is a sneak peek. Hi everyone, I'm Fern from Evidence of a Crime, a true crime podcast. I use extensive research to respectfully tell the stories of missing people, unsolved, cold cases, murder cases and more from around the world. I've covered well-known cases such as Jacob Wetterling, an 11-year-old boy who disappeared in the USA, but mostly cover lesser-known cases, such as the disappearance of Ruth Wilson, the murder of Carl Bridgewater, and the double murder of Monica and Dominique Frome. You can listen to Evidence of a Crime on all podcast platforms, or search Evidence of a Crime to find me on social media. Now, let's head to the episode... One you've got, two, three and four to come. These were the chilling words spoken by the suspect as his icy gaze looked upon the officer sat across the table from him. A week earlier, the six foot five man with his distinctive hairstyle and cocky attitude had been implicated as the individual who had committed a burglary at his neighbour's flat, for which he had been questioned and released. Now, the petty thief and burglar was being interrogated for the murder of Marcus Law, another neighbour who was disabled and confined to a wheelchair. But as Anthony Arkwright had warned in an emotionless manner, as he placed the four of hearts from the pack of playing cards on the table, one you've got, two, three and four to come. So who was this cold-hearted individual, who was unmoved by the accusations against him? He was 21-year-old Anthony Arkwright. Born in 1967, he was a third of five children, who lived in Rath-on-Dern, once referred to as the Queen of Villages by the poet and newspaper editor James Montgomery, who lived in the area during the 19th century. The town sits seven miles east of Doncaster and less than three miles from where the Beast of Wimwell lived. The picturesque small village rapidly changed when the area began producing coal causing the population to grow, leading to the expansion of the village, with new homes being constructed to house the workforce, transforming the quiet settlement into a bustling town. The rise in the coal industry led to the construction of a canal to transport goods and later a railway line. The canal was one of the first casualties of the town's decline, as it proved cheaper to send freight via train. The waterways were abandoned and were finally closed in 1961, the remnants now buried beneath new roads and housing. In 1988 the coal mines ceased operation and the railway links were severed as part of drastic government cuts to the National Rail Network, leaving the town cut off and the many miners out of work, this including Arkwright's father, although it is not certain how much of a relationship they shared. When Arkwright was just four years old, his mother walked away from her husband and five children, 
This had a devastating impact on the child, as he ended up living in numerous care homes, being passed from one location to another, never having a sense of belonging anywhere. This made him a very unhappy and unsettled child, who was psychologically haunted by thoughts that he was the product of an incestuous relationship between his absent mother and his strict grandfather, whom Arkwright claimed was a bully. An inattentive child at school, Arkwright found himself in trouble regularly, and did not perform well academically. As he reached his teens, he began to commit criminal acts, starting with petty thefts. His offences escalated to burglary and arson. This path led to just one place, Borstal. These facilities were first introduced in 1908, designed as a way of reforming young offenders between the age of 15 and 21. The minimum age was increased in 1969 to 17. Life inside Borstal was about education and regimentation. Routines were established and strictly adhered to, with the young offenders expected to wake up at 6am, sharing a dormitory with at least six other boys. The day would start with exercise before they would have a simple breakfast of either porridge or bread and jam. The inmates were expected to assist in cleaning and other duties, as well as partaking in manual labour. They received a basic education and were taught a trade such as baking or building. When they were at Borstal, visitors were not permitted. However, the inmates were rewarded for good behaviour with opportunities to play card games, darts or just socialise with others. Ewan James, in an article for The Guardian, recalled his experiences in Borstal in the 70s. Quote, I remember the experience as a mixed bag. The prison criminal subculture dominated. Baroning, the lending of tobacco at extortionate interest rates, was rife, as was taxing, the taking of protection money from the weak. The prisoner hierarchy was like a juvenile delinquent's gladiator school. There was plenty of sport and other education, until the prison officers went on strike and kept us locked in our cells for most of the summer of 1976. Two to a cell, sharing a bucket for a toilet. But the regime was punitive and encouraged a social detachment. There was no therapy or counselling, not much kindness or gentleness. Enforced competition in games such as murder ball encouraged us to be tough and any sense of pride instilled in us was, in retrospect, distorted. Any good I got from the experience was undermined by the reinforcement of many of the negative qualities I'd been taken into Borstal with. I know my stay of 13 months left me a lot more dangerous than when I arrived. As for reoffending, I met a number of my Borstal contemporaries later in the adult prison system, serving long sentences. One served life for murder alongside me. I wouldn't blame Borstal, but it failed as an intervention, end quote. Anthony Arkwright was not the only killer who spent their teenage years in Borstal. At 16, the child killer Ian Brady was sent to Borstal for two years, after he confessed to stealing some banana boxes. While there, he ran a betting syndicate and sold contraband. He would later go on to murder five children with the assistance of his girlfriend, Myra Hindley, becoming the most hated couple in Britain. The man dubbed the Gay Slayer, who he murdered five men, Colin Island, was also sent to Borstal in his teens. He was initially found guilty of theft, and while serving this sentence, he set fire to another inmate's possessions. When he was 17, Island was convicted of robbery. Once again, he was sent to Borstal, but this time he managed to escape for a brief time. The crimes both these men have committed made them infamous, but there was one murderer whom Anthony Arkwright idolised above all of us. He admired that a hundred years earlier this person's crimes had fascinated and shocked people, both with their brutality and the anonymous nature of the perpetrator. In 1888 he stalked the streets of Victorian London, murdering women in horrific ways and disappearing undetected into the night, claiming the lives of five victims, before the murder stopped and the legend began. Arkwright aspired to be the next Jack the Ripper. Forensic psychologist Kerry Danes stated, quote, He idolised Jack the Ripper, and spent time in the library poring over books about him, because he was a figure of power and horror. 
It's clear he enjoyed the theatre of his killings and wanted to be this figure of mystery and power like Jack. At 21 years old, Arkwright had left Boystall and was residing on Denman Road in Wathon Dern, a typical suburban street with a mix of 1960s semi-detached houses, bungalows and a number of low-rise blocks of flats. Within one of these, Arkwright lived. He had also begun working at a local scrapyard and seemed to be staying on the right side of the law. Despite these positive changes in his life, he quickly became known as a man with a volatile nature, someone who would be chatting with his friends one moment and arguing with them the next. He was also proving to be an unreliable employee and on the 26th of August 1988, he was summoned to speak to his manager who pointed out to the 21-year-old that his timekeeping and attendance were unacceptable and he had no choice but to fire him. Enraged, Arkwright headed to the pub and started drinking, which continued that night when he met with his friend Neil Hurst and Neil's cousin. Clad in all black combat gear, Hurst advised his friend that he cannot go out dressed like that, and so he provided Arkwright with some of his own clothes to wear. As the trio got into the car to leave for the nightclub, Marcus Law, who lived in a bungalow situated next to Arkwright's flat, rolled his wheelchair into the road, stopping in front of the car and was joking around with Neil. As Neil told Marcus to go away, Arkwright muttered, quote, I'm going to kill that bastard. Neil recalled that there was intent in his friend's words. Upon arriving at the nightclub, the three men drank and danced, and as he became more intoxicated, Arkwright confided in his friends that, quote, it was murder at the allotment today. Neil had no idea what Arkwright meant, but before he could get an explanation, his friend had walked away and was now dancing erratically on the dance floor. He appeared to be high on adrenaline and, as he moved about in a bizarre fashion, he began to bump into other clubbers. The 21-year-old's behaviour became so strange that the bouncers determined that he was drunk and so escorted Arkwright from the club. When the trio returned to the flats just before 3am on the Saturday morning, Neil and his cousin bid farewell to Anthony, who proceeded to walk towards the block, but as his friends walked away, they heard the 21-year-old pick up a metal dustbin, the lid clanging as he drunkenly lifted it, and proceeded to throw it through the window of a ground-floor flat. He then stumbled away into his own property. Just four hours later, there was a loud knocking at Anthony Arkwright's door. Still suffering the effects of his drinking, he sleepily slumped across the carpet to answer it. In the hallway stood a police officer, who advised the hungover 21-year-old that he was under arrest on suspicion of being responsible for the burglary of Raymond Ford's flat, which lay just across the hallway from Arkwright's. While the suspect was being held in the station, police conducted a search of his property, where they uncovered a vast collection of knives. They also found items that seemed out of place, including a pocket watch. What they didn't find, however, were the items that Raymond Ford had reported as missing. These included an antique mantel clock and a microwave. After a couple of hours of questioning, Arkwright calmly explained that he just enjoyed collecting knives as a hobby and denied any involvement in the burglary, claiming that he was a good friend of Ford's and wouldn't dream of stealing from his neighbour. Arkwright struck police as a cool character, who throughout his interviews maintained his composure, except for when he was questioned about the pocket watch they had uncovered at his flat. With the mention of this object, Arkwright became inexplicably unsettled, but gave no suggestion of why. And with no evidence to prove that he was responsible for the burglary, Arkwright was released on bail. PC David Winter drove Arkwright home from the station, and made an attempt to speak to Raymond Ford to take a statement regarding the burglary, but received no answer after knocking at the man's door. Seeing the officer's attempts, Arkwright suggested that Ford had probably gone out drinking somewhere, so PC Winters decided to leave and try to contact the absentee later. As Monday the 29th of August dawned, Mrs Law headed to visit her 25-year-old son Marcus, who lived in a specially adapted bungalow on Denham Road. Her youngest son had been confined to a wheelchair after being paralysed during a serious motorbike accident, so his mother would regularly visit him to help him around the house and take care of him. 
As she made her way towards the bungalow, she was stopped by a tall, slender man with spiked blonde hair. He offered his condolences regarding the suicide of her son. Stunned by this remark, Mrs. Law watched as the man walked away, unaware of the wicked smile on his face. I wonder what she thought in that moment. It is logical to believe that this was a case of mistaken identity, and the man thought she was someone else. But as she opened the door to her son's house, the chilling words that Arkwright had just uttered struck her like a knife in the heart. For there, in a blood-soaked living room, was the body of her son. When officers arrived at the scene, they were struck by the horrific nature of the attack on the defenceless man, who, although well-built and physically strong in his upper body, would not have been able to fight off an attacker. Marcus had been stabbed dozens of times. The coroner would later conclude that he had sustained over 70 knife wounds. The victim's stomach had been cut open, and a crutch had been driven into the abdominal region, causing the object to be in an upright position when Marcus's mother and officers encountered the body. The man with shoulder length, black hair and a full beard had also been subjected to humiliating treatment. His eyeballs had been removed, and in their place cigarettes had filled the sockets. His killer had also stuffed cigarettes in the victim's nose, mouth and ears. One officer later described that Marcus appeared like some grotesque, quote, birthday cake. Having taken a statement from Mrs Law, who was naturally shaken by the sight of her son, investigators were able to pinpoint a potential suspect. Her description of a tall, thin, spiky-haired male sounded like Anthony Arkwright, and within hours he was arrested on suspicion of murder. Sitting across the table from the suspect, Detective Inspector Bob Meek had the task of interviewing Arkwright, which the detective later admitted was an intimidating task, not because of the accused man's height or build, but because unlike most offenders he had interviewed during his time in the force, he could not connect with Arkwright on any level. The 21-year-old seemed void and difficult to read. Steve Smith, Arkwright's lawyer, recalled the first time he encountered his client and the look on his face. Smith described visiting a prison and while waiting to speak to the person he was representing, a dark-haired man caught his eye. There was something about the inmate's gaze that unsettled him, the same look he saw in Anthony. When he asked who the prisoner was, he was informed that he had just been face-to-face with Peter Sutcliffe, the infamous Yorkshire Ripper. Throughout the interviews, both the lawyer and the investigator recalled that Arkwright came across as a man who was confident and took delight at being the centre of attention. He played games with the officers, and he didn't seem concerned by the serious nature of the accusation against him, as he continued to maintain that Marcus was a friend, and he would not have done anything to hurt him. As the hours passed, the investigating officers allowed the detainee to have breaks, leaving him with a deck of cards to occupy himself. It was during the process of one of the interviews that he removed the cards from the pack and uttered, Would you like me to tell you the future? He then carefully turned over each card, one by one, until he unveiled the four of hearts. Placing it in the centre of the table, he stared at the detective and stated, quote, One you've got, two, three and four to come. Was this a cryptic confession? And if so was the suspect implying that Marcus was not his only victim. It wasn't long before they would receive an answer to this question, as Arkwright's lawyer was asked to step out of the interview room, where he was informed that they had now discovered a second murder, that they believed the suspect was also responsible for. Steve recalled that he was stunned by this information, but it was the officer's words after this statement that haunts him, as he was advised, quote, We are still counting the stab wounds. PC David Winter had still been unable to contact Raymond Ford regarding the burglary at his flat, and so he had gone to the 45-year-old home to do a welfare check. Raymond had once been a school teacher, and his career had allowed him to teach overseas. However, it was while he was working in Borneo that he contracted a disease which forced him to return home and leave the profession he loved. Unable to work, his life spiralled into a vicious cycle of depression and alcohol, which he found it impossible to break. 
Concerned for Raymond, PC Winter hammered on the door, calling out that he was from the police through the letterbox, but he got no reply. As he approached the side of the property, he noticed that the living room window had been shattered, and although the interior was cast in shadow, he could make out the silhouette of a metal dustbin, which PC Winters concluded was the cause of the broken window. Still with no sign of the man he wished to speak with, and the evidence of foul play, David Winters forced entry to the flat, and encountered what was later described as, quote, the most brutal act of slaughter I have ever seen. It is all the more chilling when you realise he must have spent at least half an hour inflicting these terrible wounds. Stepping over the threshold, David was met with the remnants of Raymond's alcoholism, with empty beer bottles strewn across the floor, and the dank smell of stale alcohol clung in the air. It was clear that, as well as being a man who suffered from depression, who numbed his pain by becoming intoxicated, he was living in squalid and cluttered conditions. Piles of newspapers blanketed the floor, concealing the carpets. Rubbish and other items littered the place. All signs of the occupant's depressed state of mind. How many of us have had a drink after a stressful day and find we feel more relaxed for it? This is because alcohol can affect the chemicals in our brains. However, the more we drink, the less effective your favourite tipple can be. And for many, it can lead them to feel depressed, aggressive or anxious. But it's that initial reaction that dulls your inhibitions, makes you feel relaxed, that encourages you to drink more. And when a person is feeling lost, helpless or grieving, this can lead to them turning to drink for that first numbing quality without realising that with every sip they are becoming more reliant on its suppressing effects. According to drinkaware.co.uk, quote, drinking heavily and regularly is associated with symptoms of depression, although it can be difficult to disentangle cause and effect when the two go together. Alcohol is known to affect several nerve chemical systems, which are important to regulating mood, end quote. As the officer made his way into the living room, the only light came from the television, which was playing to an invisible viewer. The pipes hummed as heated water flushed through them, but the hum of the television and the creaking pipes were the only noise to fill the dimly lit room of disorder. David proceeded through to the hallway. The floor was littered with shadowy objects, and dark red droplets stained the walls. Reaching the bedroom, the officer pushed open the door. Scarcely any light filled the room. Clothing lay all about, and in the corner of the room, the officer was just able to perceive the presence of a lifeless body. Finding the light, the officer was brought to the horrifying realisation that he was standing in a crime scene, and that the items that had littered the floor leading to the bedroom that he had stepped over were not just random pieces of rubbish. They were the dead man's organs. Although it initially looked like a frenzied attack, the conclusion was reached, however, that the killer had not acted in anger, nor had he lost control. It was a deliberate and methodical assault, performed in a calm manner. During examinations of the scene, the forensic team discovered a devil's mask, but the collection of other evidence was hampered. The flat was cluttered. The central heating had been left on, and the body had lain undiscovered for several days which meant that vital evidence, including the blood, had become degraded. As for the victim, the pathologist found that Raymond had been subjected to a horrific and persistent attack. The killer had used two knives to inflict over 250 wounds. One of the knives had broken, and the other blade was found in the body cavity. His organs had been removed and placed around the room in a manner described as being, quote, like bunting. It was a scene reminiscent of the murders committed by Jack the Ripper. When Steve Smith advised Arkwright that his second body had been found, the lawyer recalled that his client just laughed. The suspect's attitude made police more determined to ensure they could keep him in custody, but they were running out of time. In just four hours, they would be forced to either charge him with the murders or release him due to insufficient evidence. Remembering Arkwright's sickening statement when he produced the Four of Hearts, investigators are eager to ensure that those known to Arkwright were safe and unharmed. 
Officers were sent out to the addresses of people associated with the suspect. And it was PC David Winter's task to visit the 21-year-old grandfather at his detached three-bedroom property on a cul-de-sac in the neighbouring town of Mexborough. Approaching the well-kept property on Ruskin Avenue, the officer got an uneasy sense that something was wrong. Perhaps he was still shaken up from his discovery of Raymond Ford. Or maybe he now knew first-hand what their suspect was capable of, and when he received no response, he acquired a ladder and accessed the property through an upstairs bedroom window. Winters initially noticed a contradiction in the appearance of the bedroom. It was clean and well looked after, with the bed made immaculately, so the pile of clothes that had been emptied out of the wardrobe seemed out of place in the otherwise pristine room. He found his way to the kitchen, and there on the floor, lying parallel with the wall and table, was the body of 72-year-old Elsa Conradite. She was the housekeeper for Arkwright's grandfather, and had sustained serious wounds to her head, which had been inflicted by an axe that had killed the elderly woman instantly. Elsa and Arkwright's grandfather, Stanislav, had moved to the UK from Lithuania as refugees at the end of the Second World War, and they had settled in Wapondern, with Elsa being a live-in housekeeper. P.C. Winter had now found the third of hearts. But he was concerned by the absence of Stanislav, and having made inquiries with people on the street, he quickly learned that Stanislav would spend his days at a local allotment, roughly a mile away on Adwick Road. Heading to the 68-year-old's favourite patch, he found the entrance to the shed was lined by hedges, which created a secluded single track that led to a wooden structure, within which P.C. Winter's hoped to find Stanislav tending his plants, but instead he discovered the fourth heart. The grandfather was laid against the rear wall of the shed, his body motionless, with blood pooled on the floor about him, his head resting on a wooden crate, with visible and severe injuries. It was clear that Stanislav, like Elsa, had been there for a number of days. He had sustained a knife wound to the neck, which had severed a nerve paralysing the 68-year-old. His killer then attacked the helpless man with an axe before striking him about the head with a 14-pound lump hammer. Despite the four victims that Arkwright had alluded to, he refused to accept responsibility and continued to taunt and play games with the investigators. But after being interviewed a dozen times, he slowly started to drip-feed the police cryptic information. The first murder he admitted to was Marcus Law. It took more games for him to reveal his secrets. In one interview, he began to hum a melody, and when the officer was able to recognise the tune, Arkwright rewarded him by confessing to the murder of his grandfather Stanislav and Raymond Ford. When it came to the death of 72-year-old Elsa, Arkwright described what happened prior to her murder, but never took responsibility for her death. He seemed to be affected by her demise, almost to the point where Arkwright appeared to regret what had happened to her. The police had a complex web to untangle, and needed to discover exactly when each victim had been killed, and possibly find an explanation for the killing spree that had lasted at least 56 hours. Inquiries began to fill out the timeline for them, starting with the burglary that had occurred at Raymond Ford's flat which the tenant believed had been committed by Anthony Arkwright. Investigators learned that on Friday the 26th of August, Arkwright had been dismissed from his job at a local scrapyard due to his poor timekeeping and attendance. Having left work, the suspect had arrived at his grandfather's allotment, arriving at roughly 4.30pm. At some point during his visit, Arkwright attacked his grandfather in what he claimed was revenge for all the years of bullying his grandfather had made him endure. Perhaps the attack was sparked by him advising Stanislav that he had lost his job, leading to his grandfather calling him names that enraged his grandson, causing him to attack. Or maybe Arkwright had asked him for money and Stanislav had refused. This idea is backed up by the fact that Arkwright was found to be in possession of his grandfather's pocket watch which he may have planned to sell for cash. Whatever the reason, he left his grandfather to die alone in his shed. 
Forensic experts have suspected that Arkwright's rage towards his grandfather was born out of the 21-year-old's belief that he was a product of incest, something that had deeply affected him and made him a target of bullies at school. There is, however, no evidence that Stanislav was Arkwright's father. But psychiatrists believe that these rumours, combined with his unsettled upbringing and strict grandfather, caused anger to build up in Arkwright, until, having lost his job, he was no longer able to contain his negative feelings and lashed out. Arkwright then targeted his next victim, 72-year-old Elsa Conradite, whom he struck over the head with an axe. It was speculated that she was murdered because she caught Arkwright stealing his grandfather's £3,000 savings, and perhaps that is why he is affected by her death, as he originally had no intention to kill her. I also wonder if the emptied wardrobe was from Arkwright looking for a change of clothes in exchange for his blood-stained outfit. Having murdered the housekeeper, Arkwright left the property and headed back to Denman Road where he joined Neil and his cousin in a trip to the club, setting off after the prank Marcus Lord carried out, when he blocked the car with his wheelchair. Although Neil and his cousin found Marcus's shenanigans amusing, Arkwright seemed angered and stated that he was going to kill the paralysed man. Neil may have taken this threat more seriously had he known that he was sat in the car with the double murderer, but unaware the trio headed out to the club. Neil thought nothing of his friend's comments, quote, that it was murder at the allotment today. The group returned home about 3am, having been kicked out by bouncers due to Arkwright's erratic behaviour. The friends parted ways, and as the cousins walked away, they observed Arkwright shatter the window of Raymond Ford's flat. But what they did not see was their friend, dressed in just his underwear and a devil's mask, break into the former teacher's flat intent on revenge for being accused of the burglary. He woke Raymond from his slumber, and the last thing his victim would have seen was the ghoulish mask in the darkness, as he was viciously attacked, disemboweled, and his organs hung about the house in a grotesque manner. Half an hour later, with his victim now deceased, Arkwright headed across the corridor to his own flat, where he showered before heading to bed. He would be woken just four hours later by the police, who arrested him on suspicion of burglary, the officers unaware that Arkwright had now claimed the lives of three people, one of whom was in the flat opposite. He was only in custody for a number of hours, before being released, and upon being escorted home by PC David Winters, who attempted to contact Raymond Ford, only to be convinced by Arkwright that Ford was probably out drinking somewhere, So the officer walked away, ignorant to the fact that the man he wished to speak to had been brutally murdered. Having been released on bail, the triple murderer headed out on another drinking session, and that Saturday night he paid a visit to his friend Neil Hurst. The intoxicated man hammered on the door and shouted for Neil to answer, but disturbed by Arkwright's manner, Neil did not open the door, and he learned the next day from neighbours who had looked to see where the shouting had come from, and had witnessed a tall, spiky-haired man wielding a long-bladed knife. Neil would quickly realise how lucky he had been, when he called around to visit Marcus Law on Sunday afternoon. When he got no response from his wheelchair-bound friend, Neil proceeded to let himself in through the back door. When he stepped into the living room, he found Marcus lying dead behind the sofa. This discovery sent Neil into a panic, afraid that he would be implicated in the murder, and more afraid of what Arkwright would do to him. Neil fled the scene and did not report what he had found, leaving the body for Marcus's mother to find the following day. Arkwright confessed to three of the four murders, and gave some explanation for why he chose these particular victims. His grandfather had bullied him, Raymond Ford had accused him of burglary, and Marcus Law had been taking cigarettes off him for months without repaying the favour, and this he claimed is why he placed unlit cigarettes in various parts of the disabled man's body. The one murder he did not confess to was that of the housekeeper, Elsa. Although investigators strongly suspected he was responsible for her death, they couldn't build a sufficient case for a trial, 
and therefore the 72-year-old's murder is being held on file. Arkwright was charged with three counts of murder, and while being detained at HMP Hull, he attempted to present himself as insane. In one instance, he covered the walls of his cell with excrement. His pretense was enough to convince prison doctors to transfer him to a psychiatric hospital for assessment. His act could not fool the psychiatrists, who declared him sane and fit for trial. One specialist declared that the patient was, quote, the sanest person in the building. Anthony Arkwright stood trial at Sheffield Crown Court in July 1989, having pleaded guilty to three counts of murder. During mitigation, James Chadwin, QC, told Sheffield Crown Court that his client was, quote, a young man suffering from severe personality damage and disorder. He has shown signs of disturbance from the time his mother left him at the age of four. With these circumstances taken into account, the accused was handed a life sentence, with a minimum term of 25 years, which would have made him eligible for release by the age of 46. This sentence was reassessed a year later, when the Home Secretary, whom I wish I could name, but all the sources I found quoted different people, declared that due to the nature of Arkwright's crimes, combined with the real risk he posed to the public, the 21-year-old should never be released, making him the youngest person in Britain to join this exclusive group of those handed whole life terms. Following the conclusion of the trial, Zoe Wood, Arkwright's mother, who had abandoned her infant son, gave an interview to the South Yorkshire Times, stating, quote, He should never come out, or at least not until he is a very old man. I dread to think what will happen if he does. My family and the community will be in grave danger. This once again is one of those cases where the sensational aspects overshadow the lives of those who were murdered. Stanislav Podokis and Elsa Conradite must have witnessed atrocities during the Second World War, arriving in the UK as refugees in search of peace and safety, to be slaughtered in such barbaric fashion by Stanislav's own grandson. Raymond Ford, who, having to give up the career he loved, fell into a vicious cycle of drink and depression. His last moments alone in the darkness, with the devil's face staring down upon him. And Marcus Law, just 25 years old, his prospects taken from him after a motorbike accident left him disabled. But he was a fun-loving and well-liked man, whose badly mutilated body would be discovered by his mother. Marcus's father struggled to come to terms with his son's death, racked with a feeling of guilt, falsely believing that he should have done more to protect his son. Unable to live with the pain, he took his own life. Having watched the documentary When Life Means Life, my heart truly goes out to PC David Winters, who was the first officer on three of the four crime scenes. Just hearing him describe his experience sends chills down my spine. During that weekend, PC Winters stepped into a real-life horror movie. As for the man who committed such vile acts, his ambition to be as infamous as Jack the Ripper has failed. His crimes have faded in people's memories, his name relatively unknown. If I could, I would not have mentioned his name at all, hence why the title of the episode is Confessions on the Cards. But there are those we should not forget. Elsa Conradite, Stanislav, Pudalkas, Raymond Ford and Marcus Law. Thank you for joining me for episode 38 of It's Murder Up North. Episode 39 will be available next week. So in the meantime, keep an eye on those shadows 